Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Level Up podcast. I'm your host, Ken Rose, co-founder and CTO at OpsLevel. OpsLevel is an internal developer portal that helps engineering teams quickly ship quality software. Our Level Up podcast explores challenges, best practices, and stories from some of the brightest engineering and DevOps leaders about what it takes to build great products, teams, and companies. Today, I'm honored to, w- to welcome Sarah Wells to our podcast. Sarah spent 11 years at the Financial Times, which is one of the world's leading global business publications. She worked across a variety of technical roles to lead efforts around technical strategy, engineering enablement, and ensuring that architectural and coding decisions were well thought through. Sarah is also the author of a new O'Reilly book named Enabling Microservice Success. It's currently in early access and covers a lot of the lessons she learned while at the Financial Times. It covers a variety of topics around how to be successful with the microservices architecture, including approaches you should take from the start, potential traps that are most likely to trip you up, and the organizational structure that you should be working towards. So Sarah, thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So you were at the Financial Times for 11 years, right? Which is a a, a ton of time and I'm sure you have a ton of... Maybe why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about the Financial Times, the scale they operate at, and a bit about your journey there. Uh, Well, so I am... It was a very interesting time for me to join the Financial Times about 11 years ago. So so it's a, a business newspaper that at the time I joined, had started to look at web first, web being the, the more of a focus than publishing the newspaper. So you still obviously have a newspaper, but started to pay a lot more attention to people reading the news online, whether that's on a on a computer or on a, a mobile. Um, we really went from being a company that released code fairly infrequently to one that released code enormously frequently so when I joined uh, we released um, code to production for publishing platform and for the website probably 12 times a year because we couldn't do zero downtime deployments so we had to do it at the weekend luckily with business news the financial times is a business newspaper you can tend to find a a slot at a weekend where there's not as much work uh, much stuff going on because we had to freeze the website we couldn't publish publish things during that and we went to maybe 20,000 30,000 releases a year by the time that I left because we had totally changed the way that we built things. We had uh, moved to the cloud, we'd adopted a microservices architecture, and we'd really given teams a lot of autonomy and ability to choose their own approaches to to building things. That's amazing. Uh, When I just think about that, that like multiple order of magnitude shift in deployment velocity from like 12 times a year to like thousands, like tens of thousands. you talked about this idea of, you know, this microservices journey, um, you know, and in your book, I think you talk a lot about I mean, the entire content is how to be successful with microservices. Mm. What, what are some signs that microservices are a good fit for an organization? And then what are some signs that maybe uh, they're not a good fit for an organization? I think microservices are generally a solution to an organizational problem. You want to split your services up once you have too many try- people trying to work on your on your system at the same time. So if you've only got one team of people building a product, you, you don't need microservices. You may choose to use them because you want to use different technology and in different technology in different parts of your of your stack. But generally, you find microservices are useful at the point where you want to have teams work pretty much independently. So by dividing the system up into microservices that are deployed separately, you're giving teams that ability to release their code when they're ready. And that lets people release code far more frequently. So they are they're there to try and uh, enable teams to make faster uh, progress with delivering business value. And just for context, like how, how many engineers were on the Financial Times engineering team, right? To, to give us a sense of like, why, why was it the right choice there? Maybe maybe 200 engineers across the whole of the organization, something like that. Um, But even within particular areas, so the content publishing uh, platform that I worked on, uh, uh, which was the first place where I, where I encountered microservices, we had maybe 20 uh, engineers and you're you're working three or four teams. It it makes it a lot easier to split things up into smaller services. And we, we built actually a lot of microservices. We we were very early adopters. And at the time, it really felt like they should be, you should be having things that really were um, doing one thing and very small services. So we probably had 150 services within within that team that we were we were that we built and ran. 
and they would do one but they would do one specific thing i think we may have um, gone too far with that because there's a lot of work that comes with having multi having 150 microservices anything that you have to do for every service suddenly that's a lot of time um but it does let you think quite sensibly about your code base and it's much easier to pick up one of those microservices and understand what it does because it just does a very little amount of stuff right how did you um what was the inflection point for the financial times to say like hey our current structure isn't working we actually need to adopt microservices you mentioned you folks were, were early adopters i it's interesting. I I just know that there were three big new projects kicking off at around the same time, and each of those each of those projects uh, chose microservices architecture. So I think there was a sense that a lot of the people at the FT were thinking this is what's going to allow us to move fast. I'm not going to recommend like everybody moving to microservices at the same time because it we all had to learn independently uh, how to do it best but but it worked for all of those three projects those three products that we were building we built but we built the website we we built the subscription soft the subscription uh software and we we built our content publishing platform and they, all of them used a microservices architecture and it just let teams make progress uh, pretty independently nice one of the things I remember you and I chatted about uh, earlier was that you built a system at the Financial Times called BizOps, which was sort of this uh, catalog of all these services. I was wondering if you could talk to like what led you folks to build that and a little bit about how it was built. Yeah, so I think we were so early in adopting microservices that very often we get to a problem and we, there wouldn't be something that we could buy to, to solve that problem for us. We, we had to build it ourselves. So the problem we were solving with BizOps was really, how do you know what you have in your software estate when you have hundreds of microservices? How do, how do you know who owns what service and what they what they do? But also, if you're, um, you, if you're leaning into the fact that microservices let you use different uh, technology in different parts of your system, how do you even know what you've got across all of that estate? So BizOps started off by being something where we wanted to replace the the list of run books that we had with something that was built off a graph. So when I moved team, uh, someone had to go and update 150 run books to say the, the new team lead was someone else. But that the, the information there is a graph. So we, we built a graph database where we could say, this team has this tech lead and owns these systems. Um, and you could link it all together. And that let you have a really good insight into who owns what. Um, and how they're doing in things things like producing uh, run book information. So we started with here's our graph of data, and then we started to build things that gave gave insights on top of that. So we started we wanted to look at the qual well the quality of our run books. We knew we didn't we had lots of systems that didn't have a lot of information. So we built something that would score uh, run books based on the fields that were filled in, um, and so we could say well, this service is, gets a score of 78 and we could roll it up so we could show teams how they were doing compared to other teams and groups of teams how they were doing. Um, and it that that gave that was a little bit of gamification. It encouraged some people to, to get competitive, but also it just uh, directed people, where's the most valuable thing I could do right now? Because they could see where they could do take some action and increase their, increase their score. So that, that really worked. And, and BizOps just became the center of a lot of a, a whole set of products that let us uh, do insights and um, build on our knowledge of what the systems were that we had. Nice. It's funny because I think we've come, you know, in building ops level over the last few years to come to a lot of the same kind of lessons that like start with a catalog and start with one problem that you're trying to solve. In your case, it was run books. Other people want visibility or for security. And then, yeah, having some mechanism for gamification really helps engage your developers. Right. So I don't know there's this kind of underlying competitiveness, I think, that, that humans have. And it's like, oh, OK, we can we can do better. I think it absolutely works for some people. It doesn't work for everybody, but some. But for those people, actually, what they liked was being able to see a score. So I didn't realize when we built that that um, it really played into um, the way we did planning. So we we did OKRs. So actually, by creating uh, the the SOS system operability score, we gave people an easy way to measure how they were doing on an, an objective to do with Im improving. Uh, reliability they could they could say our objective is to improve the reliability of our systems and one of our key results will be that our run book scores are going to go up from an average of 30 to an average of 54 
or something. Nice. And so we were giving people something they could use easily to measure that, which meant they would do it. Yeah, it kind of makes the, the squishiness of like, we need better run books and actually something much more quantitative, it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant when you start from a position where you are missing lots of information. It's harder once there is data there because it's harder to realize whether it's incorrect. So yeah. finding that a field is, is out of date is a lot more difficult than just saying that the field's not there. Were there any, you know, um, tips or tricks or things you discovered along the way to ensure that there was kind of fidelity in that data? So I think the best thing you can do um, if you really want data to be correct is to is to um, extract it from other other systems. So, for example, if you can if you can so if you can link a service in in BizOps to the repository that's in GitHub and actually go straight and look at the code. We did try to keep runbook information with the code on the basis that when people were making changes to their code base, they'd also make changes uh, to the runbook. And and I guess the ideal thing you'd want is that there's there's that you have something you can test. Can you test that this is actually correct? It's hard to do though. It it really is. And a lot of what we did was a little bit more manual. So we we knew that we had um, services at different service levels. So we had the idea of a platinum tier of services and a gold tier. And um, and what we actually did was we had um, an annual review for our platinum services where someone not in the team was reviewing the runbook to see, could I use this to uh, solve a problem, a problem with this service? And you're really trying to, the run, to make the runbook something that points you at where you can find the information you need. Um, because that's where what you want is here are where the logs are here are where the dashboards are here's the stuff that's dynamic and being produced rather than a, a list of how to troubleshoot something that happened previously because in ideally you don't have the same problems repeated how um when i think about this initial problem then of building up this biz up system around run books how did you think about ensuring that there was some level of consistency in terms of how the entire engineer organization thought about like this is what a good run book is supposed to look like i appreciate the check afterwards like hey once a year we will verify but like how do you kind of get proactive in that we we actually had a uh, a first line operations team at, at the ft who would be the first responders and they do a lot of triaging and we work with them what information would they want because those run books were mostly there to take action before you have to escalate it, it's also useful to the teams that get escalated to that they can go there like let's say you get called out because there's a problem with the service you haven't looked at it in a year or maybe you've never looked at it you can use the runbook too but the the main aim was what would what would a first line triaging team need to be able to work out how to fail this over how to roll back the last the, the fact that there was a change that had just been made and to roll it back so looking at that mitigation how would we do mitigation and how would we work out who we then had to call if we couldn't use those mitigation steps? So that's how we decided on on that information. Um, and I don't we didn't have a lot of conversations about, oh, I don't like the information or there's something missing. There was enough ability for someone to um, to add additional information into intersections. OK. Was there any sort of training or enablement that you would do with your engineering team to be able to, like, you know, let them know? Or is it more just organic, like, hey, this is a good run book, everybody. This is it. Well, this is it was you were filling in the fields, so you so the SOS would tell you if there was something missing. The score would tell you if there was something missing, and there'd be some contextual help in it. But actually, I think it was fairly clear to people um, what they needed to to do. Um, one th one thing we did do alongside this was to to get those initial information into the system, so we knew about all the services. Was that we used that that BizOps system to generate dashboards for teams. So using the information that was in there to say this team owns these services, we created a monitoring dashboard specifically for that team. And so then when people said, well, oh, we're missing some of our services, we'd say, well, fix up the data and you'll get it on the dashboard. So that that really worked. If you want to encourage people to to fill in at least a minimum level of data, having something that they get from it, which is here's all my systems and I can tell whether they're healthy at the moment uh, was was good for that. Nice. You. Earlier, you talked about this tension between standards and autonomy. Uh, and I was wondering if you could go and elaborate a little bit about that. When I think about runbooks, it's like, hey, we want consistent runbooks along the way. At the same time, you want teams to be able to, like, you know, build microservices in whatever the way they want. Or, the, you know, can you talk a little bit about how you thought about um, that tension between kind of standardization and, and homogeneity versus autonomy and just you build it, you run it. So 
you folks should try to figure it out. I mean, it's it's the fundamental tension for building microservices. And I think that uh, it can be really great as an engineering team that you think, hey, I can just choose the right tool for the job. But you end up having conversations with uh, engineering teams who are who are saying, I, you know, we really want to use a different tool for um, for uh, continuous integration, or we're going to use a different uh, build and deployment tool. The the problem is if everybody's using different tools to do the same thing, no one else can help you. It's really difficult to move teams. It's really difficult for anyone else to debug when you're when you're not around. And and honestly, that's not where you should be focusing your um, ingenuity. Like it, you you choose a, a deployment tool that's five percent better. It's just that's just not important enough. So I think you have to. But but I also think you should always be free to say, look, we we've got something important that we need to do that requires a different kind of technology here. So uh, when we started to move to microservices, we could we could use a graph database. We could use a document store rather than everything being in a relational database. And that was really powerful. It's a lot easier and quicker to build new functionality if you're storing the data in the right kind of store. So I, I think the way to go is to define a set of guardrails that say this is what this is what good looks like. You need to be shipping your logs to the log aggregation store. You need to send metrics to metrics store um, we expect you to um, have security scanning on your deployment pipelines we all of the things that make mean that you go to production in a good state and you specify what those guardrails are and then you build a set of common tools that that comply automatically with those guardrails so if you're using that paved road uh, that there's a central platform team that are building and maintaining that and hopefully they're building it in a way where it's all very self-service and automated and it's not slowing you down to use it. Mostly you should use it, but there'll be occasions where you go, well, I, I need something different and that should be fine. But you should have to explain why why you need that. And if you do need it, you have a you have more responsibility because now you need to make sure that all the guardrails are complied with and that you patch whatever it is that you've chosen to use if there's security problem so it becomes a much more um laborious thing for you as a product engineering team so you probably shouldn't choose that unless it's giving you a real benefit yeah i really like the trying to quantify it in terms of like hey if it's only five percent extra like it's not worth the loss of leverage that we'd get across you know because no one can help you and you're not getting any kind of like yeah leverage across from it whereas like if it's something completely novel there is that escape hatch that's there but you really need to validate that like the existing solutions or the existing you know, pavement that we have on our road isn't going to be good enough. Yeah. I, and I think it's about trying to focus on where are the things, what are the things you're doing that are, that are unique and that only you can do. So if you're a newspaper, maybe you'll build a content management system from scratch because that's core to what you do. Um, but you probably don't, there, there are lots of other things that you wouldn't build because it's built by someone else. It's not a differentiator. It's um, it's effectively a commodity, and you can you can lean on that. You um, you use the term platform team earlier, right? And I mm. think I think at Financial Times you, you have this focus on engineering enablement. Uh, yeah. Is there a, a is there a difference between those two terms, or are they kind of one and the same? Uh, so I I liked to call the group that I, I so I was tech director for engineering enablement for the last two years that I was at the Financial Times. Um, I liked that as a name for the group because it really focused on what we were there to do. So the danger if you're called a platform team is that you think your job is to build a platform, but that's not your job. And Sam Newman wrote a fantastic blog post about this recently, which I, which is, I just agreed with so much. It, it's literally um, maybe building a platform isn't the thing that you should do. But maybe you need to build a little bit of tooling around some uh, kind of PaaS system the point is that you are there to um, reduce the cognitive load for the product engineering teams. And this, this is something Team Topologies talks about a lot. I find I got, a, I, I really like Team Topologies because it really chimes with what I've seen, like building microservices, the different types of teams that you have and the way they work together. So I see engineering enablement as being about providing self-service, um, well-documented, easy to use uh, tools to all of your product engineering teams so that they don't all have to solve the same problem. They don't all have to go and buy and configure and run. They can just concentrate on the stuff that matters to them as a for their product that they're building. And oh, and one more thing I think, which is um, 
it's a, it can be a bit of a of a mind shift from the old school platform or infrastructure teams because they were quite separate and it, i think of it as a, being a little bit like the the way that devops came along and changed the way ops worked or sre i think with with the platform engineering engineering enablement it's realizing that that you should be working with your customers these are your customers and so we were talking earlier you don't want to put a jira queue between uh you and your customers and you you shouldn't be asking people to open tickets to do a thing that's part of the of the platform for your organization you want it to be something where they can do it themselves and maybe that maybe you check a a pull request or something so infrastructure as code you're trying to make things easy yeah yeah i think uh, for our listeners that conversation was around the this inversion where um this idea that like you are treating your developers as your customers, you're trying to think mm-hmm. of, of things with a more product oriented mindset and not trying to just be this as a platform team, this team that is kind of tactically responding to just issues that come in like, Hey, I need this infrastructure set up. Okay, fine. I'll go, you know, write the Terraform for you. You're trying to invert that to say like, you can now self-serve and write that infrastructure yourself or we build tooling that will get you 95% of the way there. Yeah. So the cloud enablement team at the FT built um, blueprints for doing various things for creating serverless uh, systems for the FT. So if you wanted to uh, set up something that, that that we were on AWS, if you wanted to set up something that would that a Lambda would read off a queue and stick the result in S3, you had the template there for setting up all of the necessary components. And that just really is there to help. That's awesome. I was wondering, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about other kind of specific tools or, or uh, specific kind of artifacts that were created. Because in general, this idea of like, yes, the, you know, as a platform team, we should be product oriented and we should have self-service, easy to use tooling for, for product engineers. Um, you know, it, this blueprint thing sounds amazing. Are there other kind of tools that, that you and your team built there that you think would be you know useful for our listeners to know about? Oh, so I think having the attitude that everything should be... Um, easy for people to to do and that you only need to get involved if it's if it's if it's the no, so the 80 percent of standard stuff should be really straightforward and the other 20 percent maybe you have to work with the platform team i really like the the um the things that are um the team that managed uh dns at the ft did which is we had to move dns provider because um the provider we were on um got bought got acquired and then shut down um but we did more than just migrate. They they went for full on infrastructure as code for for DNS, and that meant that anybody could um, could raise a pull request for um, changes to changes to the DNS setup. But they went and did a survey where they asked all of the customers, "What do you like about the things, the tools we provide with, to you, and um, what don't you like?" And people said, "You know, a lot of the time I'm waiting a day or so for the PR to be approved." And they went and looked at the whole, like maybe the last couple of hundred PRs, and they basically said, well, there are some patterns here. There are some things where where we're never going to reject it, so we can automatically approve those. And there are other things that we know have to go to the security team, so we'll automatically route that. So they started creating these rules where um, you could reduce the number of PRs that re- required human um, interaction uh, with them, which just... Again, it's it was listening to their customers. It sped up um, their ability to to make progress. And they um, the team wrote a um, blog post about this. It's on the uh, FT's product and technology blog, which is on Medium. Um, and it's really nice. It's just how like it shows thinking about it in a product way of thinking and talking to your customers and responding to that. And also trying to find that balance of yeah, maybe it's risky, but but there are some things you can look at and say, well, we would just approve that every time. I really love that story. I'm, I'm speculating, right? Some of the, um, the DNS change would be, I don't know, adding a subdomain, it should be okay. But like, yeah. you know, deleting, adding just arbit- deleting something yeah. is far generally fine. I mean, I don't know if that's actually true, but, but yeah, there are some great examples in the blog post, but it's, it's just basically looking and going and thinking, what do we do? So one of the things when we set up engineering enablement was that um, in the, for, for every quarter, um, we had an objective about reducing toil. Um, and it would be reducing toil for our customers, but also for us, because the more that you can reduce toil as a platform or an engineer enablement team, the more space you have to do more interesting and innovative and helpful things. 
So so you don't want to be having to review all of these PRs either. It, it's stopping you from building some more interesting tooling that would help people. And so um, I think it's good to keep a focus on on just removing the boring stuff that no one needs to be doing manually. That actually ties in really well to the next question I'd love to ask is, you know, for this engineering enablement team, like, how did you think about their success? Like, what were those goals and metrics? It sounds like toil reduction is one of them, but also that that maybe is squishy. Like, how do you kind of, you know, is, how do you quantitatively measure, you know, oh, we've reduced toil here? Do you know, I think it's really hard to think about how you measure um, impact. So I think when you're when you're very early on in trying to introduce uh, an engineering enablement team and, and in an organization where you're struggling, something like the Dora metrics are a really good measure, because if you are uh, if you're not managing to release um, code that often um, or you're having a lot of changes that fail, then you can see the impact that, that building more automation can give and building build more tooling and more insight can give. Uh, but after a while, you tend to be doing pretty well in terms of you can release code on demand. There's small changes. You're not having that many changes that fail and you're able to fix ch- fix problems through the same deployment pipelines that you release code. After that, it's it's harder because you're basically proving how you're not getting worse. Um, I think that surveys, surveys are good. Like actually saying, are we, you know, what, what are the things that cause you pain? Um how well are we meeting meeting your needs and that and repeating those regularly so you're asking the same kinds of questions i think that's that can be can be really good um and just getting a, a sense from people of is do you think that we are doing stuff that's that's useful for you and and i think there's another aspect which i don't know that we really measured but you you sort of want to say are people actually using the things that we're building and are we getting feedback and are we iterating on that as well? Because it's quite easy to build something and then not come back to it in the next quarter. And, and actually people are maybe not using it or they're not finding it that it's not meeting the need, but they're not telling you because people are busy. Right. It, it's a, yeah, it's sort of an engagement metric of like how, how often is this thing getting used and is it providing yeah. value that we kind of originally set out to deliver? Oh, so one thing that we found was really useful is we would send people to various um, engineering forums that other group, other groups had at the FT. So if they've got a dev huddle where the, where the engineers meet to talk about things that are causing them pain, could we could we go along and and sit in on that and listen and be able to say, well, you know what, maybe we could tackle that, or maybe we already have something that we think could work, or we know there's another group that have faced that same problem and they've got a solution. Maybe that's now something we could try and make more general that other people could use. I love that. It's just, again, it's back to like product management 101, but listen to your users, like surveys fly on the wall in a tech huddle, but just like have them vent and have them talk about their problems. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I think like it's very easy for me to, I, I'm reinventing product management without any product management experience. It's just, you see that it's needed. But I, I also had someone say to me, it's like you need internal DevRel. Like I, I think that a lot of the people I recruited into engineering enablement um, were from product engineering teams at the FT. So they know the pain. They also know the people. And that really, um, and they've got that engineering mindset. So that, is a I think quite a powerful thing and and the other thing that I did when we set up engineering enablement that I'm really happy with is we um we couldn't get as many people in the group as we wanted to this is actually the the precursor that I worked on before engineering enablement they were called um uh, operations and reliability we couldn't get the number of people we wanted to um and we I negotiated that we would have people sent on secondment from other groups so we'd actually have the number of people, but it would be made up of two engineers at a time coming from other groups within the FT and spending three months with us. And it was quite a stretch for the team because you've got to bring new people on board all the time and get them to the point where they're they're comfortable and being productive. But they were our biggest advocates. They would go back to their groups and they would know what we had and they would encourage people to use it. And they also could tell us whether a particular solution was going to work in their groups and i think that 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 engagement and the secondments was a really um it was a good thing that sounds awesome it's almost like a reverse sre model like sre i think of like this centralized team of sre people and plants themselves on product teams it's almost like they take your product developers and plant them on this cross-cutting org 
build up their muscle. They learn a little bit about platform engineering and then send them back out into the into the wilderness where they can advocate and become true champions. Yeah, yeah. And and I mean, I, I remember one year we had um, we had our department, like our group uh, Christmas lunch and pretty much every person who'd come onto Comment came out with us. So they built really great relationships that uh, that really just maintain were maintained after they'd gone back to the other groups. That's amazing. I wanted to talk about um, when I think about that starting point that we talked about where you have deployments happening kind of once a month on average, 12 times a year. You know, a lot of folks talk about DevOps and talk about you build it, you run it or you build it, you own it. Like, I think everybody agrees that's the destination we want to get to. Um, but you folks went through that transformation to go from like, okay, these big kind of monolithic releases to like, no, deploying, deployment is easy. Uh, can you talk about some of the lessons learned along the way? Like, how do you actually equip teams to have the confidence to like own software and be comfortable with production? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big change for a lot of engineering teams. If you've never had to do it before, if, if what you did was wrote code, packaged it up and someone else deployed it to production and ran it. I think there's there's lots of things you can do. So the first thing is that you have to um, you have to give teams the ability to say this is not a system that I'm prepared to support. So when we were talking as the content um, platform team about supporting our our um, system in production when we built this first microservices system, uh, I had a meeting with all of my engineers and said what would make you feel comfortable about supporting this in production and what wouldn't and we came to the conclusion that there was a there was a um, a graph database we were using that was a proprietary and not many people used it and we were really struggling to understand the way that things could go wrong and we actually decided that we were going to uh, change to a different graph database before we went live uh, because we wanted to be with something that loads of people were using where we could Google <laughs> Google the error codes where we had a little bit more uh, sense that we understood what what was going on. And we did that. So having that sense of actually you can't expect people to support something where the decisions were made by someone else and they're not the ones that are supporting it, because that's what had happened there. It was a decision made by someone separate from the team that was leaving us with something that we found very difficult to understand. Um, so there's there's that as the first thing. The second thing is I think there has to be some level of flexibility in how people do support. Uh, so to different organizations, it's going to work differently. But we um, didn't feel like we had um, big enough teams to do a full on uh, rotor because people who knew these particular systems, there were maybe eight or nine people. It's a, it's a lot to do full out of hours. We thought we'd built something that's fairly resilient. So we were doing we did best endeavors. So we had a rotor and um, well, we had people's names on and you could call around um if there was a problem out of hours and the first line team would just keep calling until they got someone and that made a lot of people very nervous because there's a sense well what if i don't get hold of someone but you know what if there's only one person on on call they may not know anything about this part of the system anyway you, you can't always guarantee that the person that that happens to be answering is the one that understands it you hope that they can mitigate it there's something you can do so we we use that a bit um we did a lot of stuff to make people feel more confident so um our web team uh ran incident uh workshops where they would take a they, they it was a very analog thing they print out some print out some graphs and they'd walk a group of people through an incident as it happened and say well this is what we saw what would you have thought and this is what we next saw and this is what we did and people who were more junior could see that you know the senior people was were were casting around trying to understand what was going on but that everyone was working together and that there were things you could go and look at that would give you some idea and there were things you could do for mitigation. So it, it made people feel a lot more confident. We let them um, shadow. So you could be on a shadow a shadow on call. So when someone got called because there was a problem, we could call someone, someone who was also shadowing and they'd see the incident unfolding. And that also gives people experience without them feeling like they're at the pointy end of it all. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot you can do. And also we didn't, um, we also recognize not everyone can do it. Not everyone can do it at, at all the time and not everyone is, uh, in the right frame of mind or, or, or can do out of hours support, but we would expect you to be doing support during the working day. So everyone's supporting the system. That's awesome. I love the, uh, and I don't think I've heard much about it is like the tabletop exercises with incidents. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of teams practice kind of chaos engineering. It's like, Hey, right now live, 
we'll break something, we'll see how, you know, it, it, how our system reacts to it. And then, you know, uh, try to recover it and kind of try to simulate a baby incident, but not so much on the, like, let's retroactively replay this incident that we did have for training purposes. I, I loved it. It wasn't, it was nothing to do with my team. It was done entirely with another team. I thought it was excellent. Um, I also think it's about the culture. So I, what I, one thing I was responsible for was incident management and operations. And it was really important to me that people, people knew that there wasn't, it wasn't about blame. It was about learning from incidents and that people would be willing to help. And once people see that they're, they're more willing to, to get involved and we had people um who would step in who had nothing particularly to do with something so so we had a a public slack channel where we'd raise technical incidents and then we'd create incident specific slack channels as well and quite often a spin up some kind of um call but people could opt in they could come and join the the channel whatever and that meant that sometimes we had someone turn up and say do you know what i think i know something that might be relevant or I can I can help out with this or people could just come and see what the, how the discussions worked and and what was going on uh, I, the biggest example for me was we had an incident where um someone was was running a script as part of our DNS migration and um we don't really know what happened but we lost um ft.com <laughs> like all of all of the yeah, it was basically anything that, that was started at ft.com you couldn't access and um by the time that i joined the call because i'd been it was the time when i was traveling home and i got in joined there were about 30 people who'd seen the alerts we'd had text alerts they'd all come in to say can i help and it was amazing because it, it was just what can we do to get ourselves back to a good position like no one who joined was spent any time saying well how did this happen it was just okay how can we get ourselves back to the point where everything is okay again uh, and it was um, it was just excellent, and I was really proud of the culture of the of the company at that point. That's incredible to hear. Yeah, a true like the kind of blameless culture. Like, mm. uh, how do we meet the task at hand, and then we can worry about afterwards. Yeah, learning from the mistakes, but not you know not in any kind of a blame fashion. Mm. Great. Um, well, Sarah, you know, a question I always like to ask my guests before we wrap up is, what is your favorite music to listen to uh, when you're working? Oh. Um, I can't, I can't listen to music when I'm working. Like, honestly, I, if I'm, well, at the moment I'm writing and I really genuinely can't, I can't listen to anything that's got lyrics if I'm, if I'm trying to write because it just interferes with me thinking. Um, so actually I, I quite often listen to, um, to white noise or one of those things that's, that's a bit like that, where it's, you know, the sound of a forest, the sound of an ocean, something like that. If I've got any noise going on, that's what I do because I, because that lets me continue to, to think about what I'm trying to do. And also it stops me from getting distracted. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I think actually I found that um, I used to be able to listen to music like when I was much younger and now I have a similar thing. Like I find like, I don't know, I'll, I'll start singing along to the song and not doing the task. And so I was like, I think maybe I should try, uh, try the white noise or the, the relaxing sounds of a forest or a waterfall. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, yeah, I, I really like That's something that I find, I, but mostly I just, um, I don't have anything on. I'm just trying to trying to think my way through what I'm trying to say. Nice. And Sarah, what is the best people, uh, pardon me, what is the best way for people to follow your work on social media? Uh, so I was very much on Twitter, but I just can't like recommend. I am still there, but yeah. You mean, it's not you mean the X same. now, I think that's yeah, the, new, yeah. uh, the new branding. Um, I guess I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I am on Mastodon as well. Um, if you go to sarahwells.dev, I think there's, I've got all my social media links are on that. Um, and you can also sign up to get told more about when my book's coming out. Awesome. Which, hopefully, well, uh, it's, hopefully it's January uh, next year. That's amazing. So we'll be including all the links to yeah your Mastodon, uh, maybe Twitter, maybe not, depending, LinkedIn, uh, your website, O'Reilly's website as well for your new book that launches mm -hmm. next year. Uh, we'll be including all that information in the show description below. Excellent. Um, so, you know, uh, to all of our listeners, thank you, you know, I, and Sarah, thank you for this, this great conversation. I'm talking about all things around platform engineering and engineering enablement and microservices and just hearing about your time at the Financial Times and, and kind of the journey you had there. So it's been great having you on and just really appreciate you taking the time for us. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I could talk about these kinds of things all day. It's just really interesting to think about how do you approach, how do you approach some of these problems? 
Yeah. And for our listeners, again, if you want to hear more from Sarah, she's literally writing a book right now. So go check it out on the O'Reilly website. It's available for early access. And uh, the actual final release is going to be coming out early next year. Um, Again, to our listeners, thank you for listening to another episode of the Level Up podcast. And if you have any topics or guests that you would like to see on the show, please email us at levelup at opslevel.com. Thanks again to everybody and happy building. Bye.